Oh, friends, it is a cold, rainy afternoon, the perfect time for a Bible study. Let's continue our in-depth Bible studies through John. And I wanna show you why I take notes on the things I take notes and how I know to take notes on those things and include them in my Bible journaling and why. Let's begin. Found in you, Jesus. I get this question all the time about what I include in my Bible journaling notes. Like, what all are you writing there, girl? So I figured instead of telling you in a list, why don't I show you through a Bible study? Welcome back to another episode of our in-depth study through John. This is a series that is taking me forever, but you don't have to have watched the other videos to know what's going on today because today I'm just gonna be showing you why I write down what I write down in my Bible notes. And to do that today, we're looking at John 1 verses 35 through 42. And as you can see, I already have a lot of notes. We added these extra pages on a previous episode. So there's plenty of room for notes. Now, step one is to read the text. I'm not going to do that, but pause the video here and read these verses. And y'all know I'm a big proponent for just asking questions. You learn a whole lot more by asking, wait, why is that person speaking? Why are they saying that? Why are they using that word? Where is that location? Then if you just read it and take it all at face value. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. Just read it and ask questions. All right, already my mind is spinning with questions. Let me show you what I found. It is a little dark. Let me turn on my lamp. There we go. Moody lighting it is. Here is the pericope that we're looking at today, these like eight verses. And you guys can see I have a few notes on the passages around it, but I only have one really note on this section, which we will get to in a second. But for the most part, it's all kind of fresh and new. But I did notice there is a lot of characters, so I'm gonna wanna make sure I know who everybody is. We got John and disciples. We got Andrew, Simon Peter. So I'm gonna wanna know who all the people are. People's names and identities are really important in the Gospels, especially if they do mention somebody, it's because they're super important. Additionally, here with John, remember John is the last Gospel to be written. This gets into the context of the book, which is always something I write notes about. Typically, I'll take these notes at the beginning of the book. And here's just a reminder of some of the stuff that we've said about the Gospel of John. But of course, I take notes on the literature I'm reading, who wrote it, who they wrote it to. All of this is really important to kind of understand what we're reading and not take it out of context. But I I already do know that this is the last gospel written. He's writing this gospel, assuming that we've read the other gospels. And so John is really working off of these pillars of the faith, these early disciples and later apostles and using their testimony. So he's naming them by name and that's significant. So I would take note of that and get any kind of information I possibly could on them from a Bible dictionary that pertains to this passage. Like remember Peter's name changes or notes on Andrew. So let me read really quickly and see if there's anything that super changes my understanding of this passage based on what I find. All right, turns out much of what is said here in this passage about Andrew and Simon Peter being brothers and sons of John and disciples of John is literally here from this text. So I'm not gonna write anything down, but it did help me enhance my understanding of these characters and feel a little bit more confident that I know what I need to know about them. <laughs> but let me show you another thing that stuck out to me. While I was reading the text, there were a couple phrases that really stuck out to me that I wanted to make sure I understood. And as I was reading in the Bible dictionary, it hit me that all of these statements were said by the disciples or John himself. Their names that they call Jesus and they all have different aspects of Christ's identity and who he came to be, which is definitely obviously theologically significant here in John 1 as John is establishing who Christ is. I'm now going to want to make note that there's three different names and that there's names that other people testify Jesus to be. In that same note, I'll also want to define my terms because I'd never want to assume I know big theological statements like Messiah entirely. There's probably 
probably always more that I can learn about them. So I'm also going to give quick definitions of these phrases just from a Bible dictionary. And I would also not be surprised if I went through all my different commentaries that one of these commentaries would note that there's three different names and make some connections that I also can't make based off of the scholars knowledge of like Old Testament scriptures. Like they might be connecting rabbi's teacher, Messiah is prophecy, Lamb of God is reference to the sacrificial system and the priestly role. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was like prophet, priest, king kind of language here that they're showing Christ fulfills those roles. Again, that's something more that a commentary would note for me. But first, I'm going to start with the Bible dictionary and just make sure I know the definition of Lamb of God and really what should be coming to my mind here. What is love that the God of the heavens would stoop down to love me with grace? In the midst of my pride and rebellion, his love wouldn't give up the chase. In each breath that I breathe, when I wake or I sleep, everything I need is found in you. All in you. Writing my notes down, I made a mistake. I was trying to make a cute little ribbon. And so you see me correct that here. I just used the sticker paper. Y'all have heard me talk about it before. I love that stuff. I'll have it linked down below. But I basically just wrote down summaries of what the Tyndale Bible Dictionary had for each one of those terms and made each term its own little block. And I really focused on copying down cross references. And then I used my cute little Mr. Pen gel highlighter to color all in the same matching color as the color I highlighted the terms with so that it all kind of is easy to follow with the same color. But there was a lot I left out and I could have added a lot more notes just from the Bible dictionary alone. Okay, the lighting is so like gloomy and weird. Um, I love it, but it makes it hard for filming. It looks nighttime. Anyway, we've taken notes, or I already previously had notes on the book as literature and like who wrote it, who they wrote it to, etc. That's something I always take notes on. We took notes on the terms that are used and the people who said them. But another thing that I like to include in my Bible journaling notes is repetition. And this is super common in like the Psalms. Here there's no repetition, but you could kind of argue the three different names of Jesus is repetition of sorts. It's like a thematic repetition. So I wanted to note that here, but I also pay attention to details that are included that I would typically want to read over. Remember, these are ancient documents copied. They were expensive to write. There's not a single word in there that's just fluff. And so the fact that John here emphasizes this was all in the same day by saying, and they stayed with him for it was about the 10th hour. That's a lot of extra fluff. He's emphasizing here that the knowledge knowledge of who Christ is calls us to immediate action. And if we truly believe he is who he says he is, we'll follow him just like the disciples here. I pulled out my favorite commentary. This is the Nikent New International Commentary on the New Testament. And it says, first, we are reminded that these events took place within a single day. And second, the verb to stay or remain presents a paradigm. So to follow Jesus is to embark on a journey and to stay or remain is to continue in that relationship relationship or journey with Jesus. So I'm going to want to write that here in my Bible. And basically just summarize what the commentary said, but made sure to check myself and look for my own self at the Greek word and make sure what they said in the commentary was true, which actually confirmed something that I had in mind from my own Greek studies. I thought it meant abide and it does. So it was actually very helpful. I wrote it out, made sure to draw my faux tape. Oh, but did you catch how I covered up my mistake? I made it look like it was layered paper and then had a lot going on over the sticker paper that I used so that it kind of hid it or camouflaged it. And you can't really tell that I made a mistake anymore. All right, now I did mention that I have previous notes here. So if you're curious on what they are, it's that this passage has been sometimes called a contradiction. You see, a really important part of Bible study is being aware of how this story that's being told here is retold elsewhere. And it's told elsewhere in Mark 1, where they're called differently. All right, so in Mark 1, it says... It says that Jesus was passing along the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Andrew, the brothers, like undeniably the same people. 
Casting a net into the sea, they were fishing. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now people always get mad at me when I say this is an apparent contradiction or say contradiction tongue in cheek because they're like, you're going to make Christians stumble. But I don't want to gaslight you and act like it doesn't at face value seem like a contradiction, seem like it's saying two different things. But we have to remember, remember our notes, what we've already talked about for the book of John. This is the last gospel to be written. John's assuming we've read Mark. Mark is the earliest one. Like we know Mark's account. John's not trying to fool us. You see, Mark records their calling as apostles and here John records their calling as disciples. And we miss all of that significance if we just get caught up in, is this the contradiction? Oh, the whole Bible's not trustworthy. Or denying that there's a difference here, that there seems like an apparent contradiction. And this is the power of asking questions. So John is adding to the story of Mark and really Matthew and Luke as well to give us another picture of their calling as followers of Jesus Christ to back up what he said previously in our last study about how John was pointing the way to Christ, that he's a forerunner announcing the Messiah. And this is something I wrote in my Bible because I always want to be aware of the ways the Bible kind of speaks to itself when the Old Testament is repeated by the New Testament or quoted by the New Testament, when one piece of scripture adds to another piece of scripture or adds a different angle. I love this stuff and I know you guys probably love this stuff because we are Bible nerds. And so if I'm to sum up all the stuff that I write in my Bible as I'm Bible journaling, it's that I take Bible notes that are going to help me understand better in the future and they're notes that I would want a pastor to mention to me if he was preaching on it. But of course this can look different in so many different passages. Passages. This is just one example in the Gospel of John, but each passage is different. And if you want to learn more about the Gospels and how each of them tell a slightly different story to a different audience, check out this video here. It will definitely take your Bible studies in the Gospels to the next level. I'll see y'all there. Bye guys. Found in you, Jesus. Yeah.